Thank you. Thank you, Grace. Good morning. This is the uh, Pos Policy and Regulatory Committee uh, on Tuesday, 22nd of March. Um, we have apologies from Councillor Woolerton and for an early departure for Councillor Thompson. Um, could I have a mover, please, for that? Thank you, Councillor Lynch. And one other hand is required. Thank you, Councillor Eyre. All in favour? Raise a hand, thank you, against, mm, carried. Uh, confirmation of the status of agenda um, and receiving the reports. Uh, the CEO is going to be fluid on this meeting, so we are going to have him at the end uh, of the meeting, uh, just whenever that happens to pop in, um, that, that's where he'll arrive. Uh, are there any, oh, sorry, so I need a mover and a seconder on that. Councillor Church, Councillor Beck, all in favour, hand. Thank you, Carrie. Disclosures of interest. Are there any disclosures of interest? Councillor Church? Uh, yes, um, report number 6.8 for the Constitution of the DRC as deputy. Thank you very much. Are there any other um, disclosures of interest? No, right, then um, moving on. Um, we come to the confirmation of minutes of the meeting held on the 21st of November, seems a long while back, but that's on page five. Um, can I have a mover for that, please? Get a move. Thank you, Councillor Beck. Oh, in voice. Thank you, Councillor Beck and Councillor Thompson. Um, all in favour? Raise a hand, thank you. Against, carried. Uh, and then the second one is on page 16, which is the minutes of the meeting held on the 8th of February. And if you recall, that was the Easter trading policy uh, hearing and deliberations. Um, so that's come to us to go to council. So um, may I have a mover for that, please? Somebody that was at the meeting. Thank you, Councillor Gibb. Mayor Allen, again, all in favour, hands. Thank you very much. This is a very good one for your arm muscles today, I tell you, um, and carried. Um, Actions register. So that goes to Ms. O'Gorman, I think, whom I can't see. Oh, yes, I can see you. Over yes. to you. Sorry, I've got lots of light behind me, but I don't know how to get rid of it. I'm a little bit dark. <laughs> <laughs> I am here. Um, yes, we'll take that as read. The updates are there. Um, and if anyone has any, any questions on those, I see we've got Melissa here for one and three. Um, and I don't think Phil's here, but Roger's here if we do have any queries on number two, but we can pass any queries on. Um, just on that number two, should is there a reason that that's in policy and not infrastructure? Is there something that's eluding me here? I have a feeling it was one of the discussions we had last year that triggered that <laughs> conversation, and I can't remember what it was about it might have been oh I can't remember it would have been triggered by another conversation that was relevant to the policy and regulatory committee we can move that to the um, infrastructure look I'm, that's I'm very ha I'm very happy for Councillor Patterson to have it um, and I suspect he is quite happy to receive it um, yeah yeah that, um, oh, there we go. Madam Chair, I'm, I'm happy to have that in yeah. infrastructure. It probably fits better. But, I, yeah, I do think um, there was a conversation around it. Yeah. It might have been around about um, COVID and affecting staff, et cetera, et cetera, and some of the um, projects Project. that have been affected, yeah. So. That, that brings back a, um, a memory. Um, I'm just wondering whether it is still... Uh, to, still relevant or whether it is something that would come up in infrastructure anyway. Um, Roger, do, is, is that one of a, a project that would be updated in infrastructure? It might not even need to remain on the action register. Uh, right, no, sorry, I was just trying to work out which number two you were talking about. So we're talking about the- Page 22. Page 22, number two. Northern Re Resource Recovery Centre to remain on the register pending. And uh, for our staff can now get access to the site, currently engaging, budget this year. So what's the specific question about that one? That's a project that's ongoing, part of the LTP. Um, My question was why, um, I'm very happy to have it there, but does it sit more comfortably within the infrastructure committee? Absolutely. It's a project that will get updated in infrastructure, yes. Yeah. Well, let, let's give that yeah. one back to you, shall we? Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Um, and you Councillor Beck. Close it. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, just on number one, uh, and Melissa, I'm trying hard not to throw you under the bus, but if you could answer, <laughs> answer on behalf of your team, I'm, I'm a bit surprised that external policies, which by their definition are something that external people should know about, um, will not be available until the end of the calendar year. It's only March, for goodness sake. That's a long time to... Uh, wait, to, well, that's what it says in the update. Um, I'm just wondering whether, in fact, we should, uh, you know, just PDF whatever we've got, whack it up there, and then if um, corporate planning want to do a tidy up for consistency, et cetera, replace them as we go. My thoughts um, exactly. So I, so I can speak to that one, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I think that the comment came from last calendar year. I do remember um, writing that quite a while ago, which is probably why it returns to the end of the year. Um, we are still working on it. Um, a lot of the, so the problem that we have is quite a number of the policies are essentially one-liners or a resolution. Um, so from our perspective, they don't really warrant a policy, but their title is something policy. Um, so that's why they have been categorised as a policy which is also why we're hesitant um, to put them up on the website at this stage. But if that is uh, council's desire to get them all up there, we can um, continue to work through them. I just think it's a, uh, these are things that we actually expect our people to, our communities to be aware of. And you'd hate to think that, um, that someone would have to do an OIA to find out what our policy on something is if it's an external policy. So, yeah, I'd be very much encouraging it getting up there as, as quick as possible. Thank you. Councillor Church? <clears throat> yes, I agree. I mean, the, the whole discussion originally was around transparency. So even if it's a one-liner, as an external policy, they're not all out there. Um, I agree this, we, if we put them out and work, if you want to work on them. But, yeah, to me, I thought it was quite a simple process of here's our external policies, put them out there and review them or even... A, you know, we could have been, will be a reviewed in the next year or something like that to let people know if there's a difference. But to me, um, it was all around transparency. But just going on to that segue of those policies, I just wanted to flag um, yeah, um, through you, Madam Chair, is um, with a district operative, the district plan coming in, whether any of the uh, overall policies will be changed or impacted by new, the new wording, for example. So I know, say, lifestyle blocks, village living to um, large lots. So just flagging that, I'm not sure if that uh, will be impacting our policies going forward and how many of them will be impacted as an overall. So it's kind of a concern I have. I can respond to that one, Madam Chair. Um, so, sorry, just an update. I have, uh, Anthea has confirmed that we have done enough of a tidy up so we can put all of our policy, all of our external policies up on the website um, as soon as possible. Uh, Councillor Church, with your question around references to the operative district plan, I had this conversation with another staff member yesterday, um, particularly with regards to our bylaws. Mm -hmm. So we are aware that um, particularly with regards to, as you say, zoning um, and references to country living or the rural area, that will, that will definitely have an impact on our bylaws. Um, as yet, we haven't done an assessment on how many of our policies that that will impact. So, ask Madam Chair, perhaps, because that's quite important if it's affecting a lot of our bylaws or potentially, then we just perhaps get an overview sometime in the future as a reference in a future agenda through you. Um, I would think. Uh, Melissa, that as you go through reviewing the bylaws as well, that will be a fact, a lens that you'll put over them. And, and the question is, are there retrospective lenses um, that we need to take, take account of? So yes that's, yes, that's a process that we are currently having discussions with legal uh, to determine what the impact is um, in the changing of terminology. So um, just up, update us perhaps yeah. at a future meeting. That would yeah, be great. Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I very gratefully received the financial assistance policy, so that could be removed as an action, possibly. 
been on there for a few meetings now at action. All right, we'll remove that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Mayor Allen. Yeah. Uh, just back to that further point around terminology, just realising in the district plan, it doesn't change the status of the land, it's just what it's called. So it is only a terminology issue. So I think it, it doesn't, doesn't, um, doesn't justify running off and changing it because of the terminology. It is still what it actually is. It's just been given another status name, that's all. Um, but when, when the review takes place, the new terminology should be brought into um, place at that particular point. Thank you. Mr. Ebenho, I saw you there before and you dashed away. It's your turn now. Oh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, I mean, just following on from Melissa's point about legal review, because that terminology changes, a lot of them are based on the national planning standards. There's a fairly clear crosswalk in some cases between what um, a zone was called and what it shall be called under the new national planning center. So I would hope that, but, but it is a legal question we need to find out, but I would, I would hope that um, an outdated reference um, isn't automatically um, invalid in a bylaw if there's a clear uh, crosswalk under new legislation that we've implemented. So um, sure. just, to, wow. just to provide hopefully some reassurance around that. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, now we're moving on to uh, page 23, which is the earthquake prone buildings consultation. Um, and we've got Melissa and Mr. Ballock who I think is loitering down. Yes, I see you now. Um, thank you. Madam Chair, I can, um, I, can, I can start and speak to this one. Uh, so with the introduction of the Earthquake Prone Buildings Amendment Act, um, it's meant that local authorities situated in both the medium and high seismic risk areas must identify all earthquake prone buildings in the area. Um, paying particular attention to those that contain unreinforced masonry. Where in the event of an earthquake, um, there's an increased risk that the unreinforced masonry will fall on the pedestrian access area um, and has a high risk of causing injuries or fatalities. So once the local authority has identified all of these potentially earthquake prone buildings, they then must undertake a consultation with the public to identify high pedestrian areas and strategic priority routes. So the Waikato district is uh, located within both the low and medium seismic risk zones. So for the purposes of this consultation, we'll just be focusing on the urban centres of Narawahia, Huntley and Tekofita, um, as those are all situated within the medium seismic risk zone uh, and other parts of the district are in the low seismic risk zone. And on that note, I just would like to point out that on page 32 of the agenda, you may have noticed that the map is incorrect. So the, the two, um, the key noting the medium and low seismic risk zones uh, have been wrong. So I have um, emailed a copy of that to Democracy. So you should have an updated copy of that in your Dropbox shortly. So a workshop was held uh, on the 16th of February to provide information to Council on these new requirements and to seek feedback on the areas that staff had identified as high pedestrian areas. And maps of these have included have been included in the statement of proposal, uh, which starts on page 30 of the agenda. Uh, just one thing that I would like to point out with these is that um, MB has not established any guidance or criteria which determines what a high size uh, high pedestrian area is. So um, as an example, what Waikato District Council consider to be a high pedestrian area could look very different to what Waipa uh, consider to be a high pedestrian area. It's quite subjective. So further to this, uh, at the workshop, staff sought feedback on not identifying strategic priority routes 
um, and early conversations with our local emergency services acknowledged that there are a number of routes between emergency services and the likes of medical centres or um, to get to another urban centre. So they didn't feel the need uh, to identify strategic priority routes, um, which is why it has been proposed that we haven't included these in the consultation. Uh, and so based on this, uh, staff recommend that council adopt the statement of proposal, statement of proposal um, and that council acknowledges that no strategic priority routes have been identified. Thank you. Um, Matt Allen, you have a question? Yeah, probably a few questions actually to try and get a better understanding here. So I'm looking on the map on page 33 that shows Riverview Road in Huntley and of course across the other side of the river is Great South Road. Now, We've identified these as high pedestrian area in correlation with what we originally set out to do is to identify hazardous walking areas with brand or overhangs and masonry buildings. When I look at Riverview Road, there's absolutely none of that down there. So why, he, why have we identified it as and could be identified as a hazard zone and yet there's no hazards as such, it's all residential. And I also look uh, on other maps that show the likes of Hakanoa Street, once again, uh, all residential, no overhanging branders, no mason, well, it's masonry buildings, but the houses. So what I don't want to do is put a put a, 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 um, a policy or whatever we call this in place, which actually puts an unfair burden on people in a residential house when they go for a consent and Merv's team look at this and says, oh, you're in a hazard high hazard zone, footpath area. So now you have to do this, this and this because you're in that area. What I don't want to do is put another roadblock in the way for people to replace their roof, veranda or whatever that is on their flaming house. So, so through you, Madam Chair, uh, Your Worship, that's not the intention of this to make it more difficult to get a building consent. So Riverview uh, Terrace slash road, there was a building on there that um, my consultants identified as a high-risk building. So it's a merely a matter of identifying whether that building is URM or unreinforced masonry or not. It may be that, that we don't have any, uh, that we don't consider that a high pedestrian route. So residential is out. It has nothing to do with the earthquake-prone um, uh formulas the way it's uh, um, assessed um, it is only buildings with unreinforced masonry commercials those sorts of buildings so Hakanoa Street there must be a building on Hakanoa Street that meets the uh, meets the criteria for a um, uh, an unreinforced masonry building that'll be why we've got that in there sir yeah, and look, and, and that's fair enough, Merv, but the trouble is you've included all of Hackenauer, and I know what it'll be. It'll be the old butcher's shop and the dairy about halfway down Hackenauer Street, so why have we included all of Hackenauer Street? The same as Riverview, and I think I might have raised this one in the workshop, was the uh, Mormon Temple on the corner there. Yeah. But it doesn't include all of Riverview Road. It's right beside the bridge. And I just, I just, I know the sort of stuff goes through, and then it comes down to interpretation by somebody, and it could be one of your team in the future, Merv, or it could be anybody, interpret this, oh, it's a hazard zone, so we've got to treat this differently. And in actual fact, it's not. It's somebody who took a yellow line and went a little bit further or identified a site on that area, but it's not the whole area. And that's what yeah. worries me a little bit. No, so I think, I think, sir, with all due respect, you're becoming confused. It's not going to be a hazard area in terms of a building consent. No, I know that, Merv. Is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so it's just I, I about, appreciate that. But yeah. we start but we start here, Merv, and, and over time we end up there. And that's what worries me. Once you open those doors and then it comes down, changes. If we've got a hazard on Hackenauer Street, identify it, and I know where it is. It's the two little shops down there. And the hazard on Riverview Road is the Mormon Church on the corner, if it is verified as that, which I think it probably is. Um, just identify them. Don't identify everything else that's within a, 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 a radius of it, effectively. That's all I'm saying to you. Okay. Um, but am I, sorry, am I, I'm seeing this correctly, that, that our role here is to identify the high pedestrian traffic areas. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yep. But it's okay. in conjunction with the zoning. Yeah, but Riverview Road's not a high 
pedestrian area anyway. So that's open for conjecture and that's a problem we have with MB. As uh, Melissa said, it's very subjective from one council. I mean, high, yeah. high pedestrian in Auckland is a whole lot different to high pedestrian in Te Yeah. So uh, some guidance, uh, some really clear guidance around that might have been useful, I would suggest. Councillor Beck, let's come back to that, but Councillor Beck. Uh, well, in fact, uh, uh, Councillor Bellock, uh, just uh, <laughs> on my words, thank you. Um, I'm just, uh, and it's to the Mayor's point about uh, let's make sure we don't open the door too far. I guess yeah. my point is which door are we walking through? Uh, you know, if, if there is confusion about MD's definition of, uh, of uh, high foot traffic, let's be very careful that each council doesn't uh, say this is high for us, so therefore we need to go out and consult and et cetera, et cetera, when actually, as, uh, as uh, Merv has so eloquently pointed out, that, um, you know, Queen Street is very different to, uh, you know, Queen Street Auckland is very different to any street in our district. Uh, and we just need to be very careful. We're not just saying high pedestrian volume for us and therefore all that follows. Uh, I'm just, I guess I'm getting increasingly uneasy and thinking that maybe our first uh, consultation should be with NB, not our public, not our ratepayers. Let's get clarity around what that actually means. And if we can't get it from NB, which is a bit of a cop out, uh, do we need to talk to our fellow councillors, maybe through, I don't know, mayoral forum or something? And, uh, and tell be what our definitions are more broadly. Uh, and if we let them then object if they don't agree with that definition that they themselves failed to provide. I just Otherwise, we get people all head up and concerned and whatever, mm. along with being over-consulted, it's consultation fatigue on something we're not actually quite sure. Um, you know we've understood correctly what the requirement is due to the ambiguity of MB's instruction. Um, so I'm going to go to Sue O'Gorman. Um, Ms Moana Tufong, I understand you're next in the... Your hand's up for next. Yeah. Um, I guess my, my understanding is that we do have quite a tight time frame on this, so we, we do have to go, and Melissa, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, we do need to go out to consultation on this. What I'm hearing is that... Um, potentially we might shrink some of the high traffic areas identified based on the location of the identified buildings. We'd have to check on the um, legitimacy of that, I guess. Um, but just remember that when, if a high traffic area, and again, please correct me if I'm wrong, Melissa and Merv, but a high traffic area, all it does is it means that the unreinforced masonry buildings, their repair um, upgrade has to occur earlier. I think that is the only implication of a high traffic area. Um, that's the only consequence of an unreinforced masonry building. It doesn't affect anyone who's not in an unreinforced masonry building at all. And all it does is it brings forward their requirement um, by a few years to, um, to upgrade. Um, is there any clarification you wanted to give on that, Melissa or Merv? No, I think that's hundred percent correct. So you've, um, you've, um, you, yeah, that's that's what it is. Yep. Um, right. Okay. So, Ms. Moana Tufongai. Um. Thank you. It seems to me that the policy we're trying we're discussing two things and then trying to merge them together. So we're talking about um, pedestrian traffic and we're talking about buildings and somehow we try to push them together. Because when I look at Ngarawa here. The place where I see a lot of pedestrian traffic is on the way to the high school, and it must be the same in any community, um, the, the road to the high school. So, you know, pedestrian traffic, that's one thing. The effect of um, unreinforced buildings, that's another thing. And I don't know that it's, uh, I don't know that the way we're trying to push them together in this conversation is working quite right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Gibb. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I, I'm just disputing Galileo Street, actually, because the only building that I was aware of that possibly was under this is Memorial Hall, and we've since been told that it's not um, as serious as what they first thought. So where else on Galileo Street is... Um, 
one of those buildings. So I can understand the other high traffic areas because there are quite a few of older commercial buildings, but not on Galileo Street. So unless Councillor Patterson has a different opinion, <laughs> um, I think we need to take that Galileo Street out of the um, consultation. Um, so we'll, we'll come to that shortly. Um, Councillor Beck and then Mayor Allen. Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm still not quite sure that we need to consult at all. Uh, and I'm, I'm just wondering, uh, given um, um, Sue, your comment about a very tight time frame, uh, I just hate for us to be doing the wrong thing because we have to do it quickly. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if we could not ask some of our, our neighbouring councils, like at a region, future proof region, something. Uh, and actually, perhaps it is that we can comply uh, with the requirement if we, based on data, based on conversations with other councils, um, realise that we don't have any high traffic areas at all, you know, given the intent of the... Of what I, the I don't area. believe we have a choice, Melissa. No. Um, again, no. correct me if I'm wrong. I don't believe we have a choice. We have to go out to consultation on this. Um, so we, we don't have a choice on that. But we could go out without any streets identified. Um, the consultation, if you if you look on um, page 23, under the executive summary, the second paragraph, um, it's regard the consultation is regarding the identification of any parts of public roads, footpaths, or thoroughfares that are near to or contain unreinforced masonry. Yeah. Um, I I think that. Um, Many streets don't have the unreinforced masonry. Ah, all the way down Riverview Road, I don't know that overly well, and I suspect um, Hakanoa Street the same. There's, a ver there's very little bits of it. So um, I would prefer to see a consultation going out that had a circle around those, those bits, if you like, and the rest of it um, uh, within a reasonable distance, the rest of it clear. So in the case of an earthquake, you, you would know it was 100 metres either side or whatever. Um, and I'm just wondering what is the most practical way to progress this because um, one way may be to have a, um, a short workshop on it, um, on, on each street, and, um, and then uh, to, to put that forward to the council meeting on 11th of April, I think it is, or 13th of April, one or the other. Um, and that still gives you time in your process as well. I just think we're going out with something. I I, I agree. It, it is like over consultation, um, but we are required to do it under the under the earthquake building earthquake prone buildings amendment act. So we're kind of I do see we're stymied on that respect. Mayor Allen. Yeah, look, I just want to go back to uh, what Maxine said, which was was right. We are trying to push two things together, but just realise that the the minute you identify. A, uh, a high pedestrian zone, you, it has implications for every building on there. And that's what I'm saying to you. Um, be very, very careful. This, this in my mind, the map goes too far. So I'm currently looking on page 36 of Galileo Street. And, and I'm, I'm with Councillor Gibb here. There's nothing along Galileo Street. It may be a pedestrian area, no different than Great South Road or any of those other streets in around there. But it's there's no hazards there. So... If once you go and put a mark on a map and identify it as a high pedestrian, every building, commercial building or whatever along there will be impacted some way or another. So be very careful where you draw yellow lines. And that's why I talked about Hackenau Road and Riverview Road. Riverview Road, there's a Mormon church on the corner. That's all it is. It's nothing else, but, it, but this includes the whole road. Hackenau Street, it's just two little shops way down the other end of Hackenau Street. So just identify those little bits. If you try and link it to back to the main street or something like that, you're just actually creating a whole lot of hurt for yourselves because people will come out and say the same thing as, how bloody stupid, there's nothing along there, so why are we doing this? So just be very careful what you go out to consult with. Don't have a problem with consulting, but be very careful with the length and the description of those yellow lines. So the um, right. building compliance are, are carrying out assessment work, um, and that's focusing on... On the priority buildings and the URM buildings, um, Mr. Ballack, um, have I got that correct? And that's expected to be finished by the 31st of March. Yes, so correct. That information will presumably allow us to make much more accurate 
<clears throat> Matt Markins, correct? Yes, Madam Chair, yes. So um, I would propose then that we wait till we have that information. And I'm sorry, it does push, push the consultation out, but I'd suggest that we wait until that have, have, we have that information, have a um, workshop, a, a quick workshop on it, going through it, through those three towns, map by map, um, and just identifying exactly which of the areas that, that are in alignment with um, the compliance report. So do you have a comment on that? Um, I was just going to check with Melissa how that would fit in with our, our time frame, our time, um, our because I think we do have a legislative deadline on this. Yes, yeah, I can't sorry. find that in there anywhere. Where is that? Oh, I might not have included it, sorry. Uh, we do have to have this done, my understanding is, before the uh, end of financial year. Um, I am sure we can squeeze something in. Yeah. Um, yeah. We might have to have. Look, I think we're, we're flying a little bit without information and yeah. we need that information and then come back on those three streets. Uh, okay. oh, sorry, those three towns um, with the information of where exactly the buildings are. All of those buildings will have been identified previously anyway, because I believe we've sent letters to them all about a year ago. Yeah. So, um, so can I just summarise what, what you're asking for? So we're going to wait. Till we've got the final um, on the 31st of March. They're delivering the final inventory of those buildings. Correct. And we're going to look at reducing down the area that is identified as high traffic so that it's in closer proximity to those buildings rather than being the full road okay. where there's mm -hmm. only a building at one end of it. Is, is that where, where you're coming yes, from? That's and that, was, that would be what would be identified in the, in the statement of proposal. So we'll go away and do a piece of work on that, Melissa and um, Merv. And, um, and come back to you. We'll try and fit in a workshop before the council meeting. Um, and then um, we'll have to make a decision at the council meeting on the statement of proposal that goes out. So is everybody happy with that approach? Yeah, okay. Um, um, Ms Moana Tufongo? Uh, yes, the, I understand that, I understand three communities have been chosen and I just wondered about um, Tuako and why that was left out. There must be like the town hall or um, church buildings that were built many, many years ago and are still standing, they may fit into the same category as well. I'm not looking for ex to create extra work, but yeah. yeah. They, they fall too. into the low risk area. Um, so it's only the ones in the medium risk area that we're required to deal with at this point in time. Um, and as you can see from the map where we had the yellow and the green round the wrong way, um, Tuako um, and Pocono, that area, they all fall into the, um, into the low risk area. I can understand Pocono because there's a, you know, there might be some old buildings there, but the majority of that community is relatively new. So Number of the it's houses. low risk. Sorry, it's low risk from an earthquake um, earthquake point of view. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So um, we have just received that report, um, and you've got um, a clear way forward on that. Excellent. Um, now up to again, um, Melissa, with your on six point three, um, the policy and bylaw review program, please. Madam Chair, um, so you will all be aware that there has been a huge amount of work um, put into this work program, both by staff and elected members, um, with a number of hearings and deliberations uh, been happening of late. But uh, what I really want to focus on with this report is the Ford Works program. Um, so we do have a number of bylaws that are coming up um, and we're just about to start the review of these. Um, and these include the cemeteries bylaw, trade waste and wastewater, reserves and beaches and the public places bylaw, which includes provisions such as parking um, and mobile trading. So we do aim to um, commence these reviews shortly um, and we aim to have them reviewed by early to mid next year. However, we do note that um, with the majority of these bylaws, they do contain um, subject matter that we're anticipating to generate a little bit of interest from the public. Um, and so therefore, 
they might take a little bit longer to review um, and also acknowledging that from our perspective, um, there will be a little bit of downtime um, through the election period as well. Um, so the staff recommendation for this report is to seek feedback on the way forward or on the forward works program um, and just wanting to get feedback on whether or not there are any bylaws that council would like to bring the review forward on. Um, however, I do acknowledge that the reviews that we are talking about or that I've just mentioned, they are all in their two year grace period. So they are required to have the review completed by, they, they vary, but they are sort of between May and uh, October next year. So we do need to get onto those ones anyway, but I'm just seeking feedback on whether or not there um, is any other bylaws that are causing problems at the moment that we might be able to switch out. Thanks, Melissa. Councillor Eyre? Thank you, Madam Chair. Not specifically in regard to your forward work program, but um, more in regard of the road closures policy. I'm, I'm sure you have, but just ensuring that you're including um, Fed Farmers there as a stakeholder in that discussion as well. Perfect. Thank you. Councillor Church. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's really more of a question rather, is around the easements policy. I'm just thinking of so much growth that we've got going on and because it's uh, data approved was uh, December, this is on page 50, the bottom. So that was um, approved in December for 2014. And with the growth, I just wonder if we've had, um, if it's working well or not, because um, I'm linking easements with um, uh, trails work that we're wanting to progress and um, growth, just to find out where, if we've had any issues around those things or if it's working well. I can answer that one if you like. Um, this is a policy that's been a bit tricky to find its owner, but I have managed to do that in the past week. So I'm hoping that there'll be a bit of progress on being able to update that policy so it is still relevant. Okay, right. So that so um, we anticipate, just because I'm trying, you know, we're doing quite a lot of work in that space around connectivity. So is that staying in the schedule or is it coming forward? Let's just see Roger nodding your head. So just a bit of feedback would be helpful. Uh, yes, it will stay in the schedule. I don't know, Roger, if you've got anything extra to add after our email conversations in recent times. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that through you, Madam Chair. Um, look, this policy basically, as Councillor Church has rightly pointed out, is quite an important one to provide legal protection for various things, whether it's electric cables through public spaces, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the main players in this space are the strategic property team, the waters team, um, the roading team and the land development engineers. So looking at where Waters is going, we really need to work out, uh, is there need for a couple of policies in this space in terms of, uh, we wanna make sure that there's a fit for policy, per, uh, a fit for purpose policy that covers essentially our roading assets, our open spaces and facilities. Um, and we need to have something that uh, waters can take with them to Entity B. So there is a review plan for this. It is working okay at the moment, um, but it is due for a look. Um, so we have the right team starting to tune into what do we need to do. Um, so I hope that kind of answers your question, Councillor Church. Yeah, thank you. Madam Chair, just one other question on that. And this is for Roger as well. But yeah, I, I just flagged also connectivity, because that's you know, more of a community connectivity, those spaces for those stakeholders and those easements. Just on page 57, you've got under your name as, a, as the policy owner as the refuge collection and disposal policy. Um, and I just wonder, uh, are you anticipating that we're gonna have some workshopping on that? Rubbish rates and roading out, you know, things that people are particularly sensitive about. Second to the bottom one on page 57. That one there. Yeah. <laughs> Yep, go. So I was just going to say that one there is being proposed to be revoked. That will be the next agenda item. Um, it's out of date now and has been replaced by the waste minimization plan. So, all right, yeah, uh, got it. Okay, sorry. Okay, so yeah, so all the things that were in it uh, carried forward appropriately in that and the other one. Yep, great. Okay, right. thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beck. Um, well, you're most welcome, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, <laughs> 
Melissa, having uh, thrown you under the bus, I'm going to try and pull you out from the next two oncoming ones. Um, firstly, could we take a um, like a sort of a leaf out of the zero harm approach uh, and say that if we've got near misses, i.e. if we've got things that have generated complaints or uh, tension or staff work or whatever, then those are the ones that we should uh, pull forward in the work program. In other words, make it easier for ourselves and fix things that, that are generating friction now. Is that something that you could maybe talk to monitoring or customer service requests or something about? There might be some guidance there. Would be a, hopefully a constructive suggestion. Because uh, I, I look at this list and I, I don't really know what's more important than anything else. I mean, they're all important. Um, that's my first point. My second point um, is the second oncoming bus. There's actually a lot of reviews here and I'm genuinely concerned about um, our community's one capacity to actually digest all of this and two enthusiasm uh, to appropriately respond. Um, so I think we need to do some quite careful thinking and I'm sure you are, Melissa, uh, about how we we best do this. You know, do we dribble them out and then people think they've done it, but actually it was a different one or do we bundle them up? Do we have a, a sort of a mega, a mega review? Um, do we tie it to the elections? Do we actually go out at the same time and try and say, hey, there's a whole lot of stuff going on in the local government space at the minute. Please have your say on who represents you and on these policies. Oh, it might be a terrible idea, but we just need to give thought to how this amount of consultation will actually register with our community and engender uh, positive uh, engagement. Mm. Through, through you, Madam Chair, that's definitely something that is always on our radar. Um, we do, where appropriate, do try and bundle up uh, like consultations. I think there is an advantage with the set of five vitals coming up that um, through different ones, they do have different uh, stakeholders. Um, you know, trade waste and wastewater generally not the general public that we're targeting for that one. Um, and although cemeteries, as an example, we do uh, open it up broadly for, consulta for public feedback. Um, it is the um, uh, crematorias and the funeral directors that we tend to target um, with that one as well. So I definitely hear what you're saying. Um, and we, yeah, we will take that into consideration around timing of consultation for these. And I think you make a very good point, Councillor Beck. Um, we, we do have the, the just the sheer over, overwhelming weight of consultation. And while it's really important to people, they, it just goes over their heads a lot of the time because of the of, of just constant bombardment. And not everybody is so absolutely as excited as I am about policies and bylaws, which is a sad thing. Um, Mayor Allen, final question? Comment? Yeah, uh, well, I did have a question. I'll just be a comment now because, uh, as a good mayor should, uh, deputy mayor should, he can read the mayor's mind. So he actually asked my question, actually. So he did really, really well there. Um, and I think um, the trick here is, is what is the uh, stone in our shoe at the moment that has not been reviewed? And and if we can, if there is a stone in our shoe somewhere, we need to bring that forward. Otherwise, we just go methodically through these and deal with them. The other point around overconsult, I, I can say that the public are tired of consulting, uh, and this is why you get the um, just the handful of uh, regular ones that'll that'll read it and consult on it, and and it's really really hard to take them seriously, considering they're only bringing one viewpoint and that's their own, and not necessarily the viewpoint of the community. So yeah, the deputy mayor covered off everything, but I think for Melissa, if there is a stone in our shoe, find it. If it's not there, don't don't go any further. Thank you. And I, I also think um, when we come up to the public places, just um, recall a conversation that we had earlier, um, I think in the council meeting about um, how wide that can go in terms of um, looking after, you know, assisting the police with the boy racer issues. Okay, um, we have a, well, we've actually succeeded our recommendation, uh, which is that we provide feedback. Thank you, everybody, you've provided very good feedback, but can I have a mover that we do provide that feedback? Uh, 
Thank you, Councillor Thompson, and seconded by Councillor McAnally. All in favour? Yes, thank you very much. Against carried. Um, on And thank you very much for that, Melissa. Um, now we are up to um, the river, our favourite one, the revocation of policies, and that is Anthea, I believe. Yes, good morning, Madam Chair and Councillors. So today I have eight policies proposed for revocation. Um, I won't go through them one by one, but they're um, basically they are quite old. They uh, span between 2007, uh, sorry, 1998 and 2012. Uh, there's a couple of Franklin District Council policies and they've either been superseded by other documents or laws or they're deemed to be out of date and unnecessary. So I'm more than happy to take any questions on those that anyone may have. Um, thank you. It was a really clear um, document. It was all very self-explanatory. Um, Mayor Allen, is your hand still up or is it just accidentally up? Yeah, no, I put it up again. I did take it down. I put it up again. Um, look, I want to move this as probably a councillor Maguire and myself probably should move and second this. Sam, we were the ones that probably put these in place well before most of you turned up. <laughs> so I'm moving that we do revoke them. Thank you. And I'll um, just take two questions um, before I take Councillor Maguire's um, seconding of that, Councillor Eyre. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just in respect of, um, I know I don't want to go into too much detail either, but in reference to the um, the rating rural community centre areas policy, now I note that it's proposing to be revoked as it is covered under the revenue and financing policy. So in going to that policy to see if it does in fact and ensure that it covers the scope of rural halls, I can't find that policy on our website, so maybe it goes to the point earlier about the front-facing policies. Um, so that's not to be found. But also in respect of that, um, now I'm trying to think of the staff member that's since left. Geordie, Geordie, uh, a year or so ago prior to leaving, began work with our hall committees in respect of asking whether they're happy with their um, targeted um, rate for their hall catchment area. So we've now sort of left, she did have some responses for those hall committees. Now we've sort of left, I feel like we might be leaving them no, adrift. It's a separate, it's a separate issue. It's a separate issue. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but could I, on that note then, could we please have the, um, the finance, revenue and financing policy. Could I get that forwarded to me somehow, please? Sure, I'll make sure that's done. Thank you, Councillor Church. Thank you, Madam Chair. Just the bottom of page 60 under discussion and analysis, just the wording says because they have been, have been or will be superseded by another document or no longer in use. So I guess the words that struck me was will be superseded because that to me infers that we will, um, and I have no problem about um, revocating these policies, but to me it seems like there's, if they will be superseded, means that there's a gap between what they're active and when we'll do something new. And I want to know which ones those, that falls into. So through you, Madam Chair, that relates to the application of interest to council reserves policy and the updated treasury risk management policy, which is, I think, the agenda item after this one. So all going well, the policy should be updated this committee mm -hmm. meeting, so there won't be much of a gap, if any, at all. OK, cool. So, okay. so 10 minutes in answer to your question, <laughs> Councillor Church. But just just, just what, looking okay. at the small words, thank you. Very well done. So I've got a mover and... Mayor Allen, a seconder in Councillor Maguire uh, for the recommendation um, on, uh, on page 60. All in favour, please raise a hand. Um, against, I see no against. Please, if you are against, please do huge waves because it's quite easy to miss you. But thank you very much. Um, that's um, passed. So now we are, um, Mr Bailey, it's your chance to shine on 6.5 census expenditure policy review. Thank, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, Page 78. Yep, thank you. The sensitive expenditure policy. Um, this is up for review. It um, just uh, take the report as read, just a couple of comments. The, um, um, the audit 
um, New Zealand report for the year ended um, June 21, made reference to updating our sensitive expenditure policy, and we've included their recommendations in this document as well. Um, in the review, um, the, the review uh, revised policy draft has been through the Audit and Risk Committee, um, who have recommended it to this committee, to in turn to recommend it to Council to adopt. Um, there's nothing major in terms of changes that are outlined in the report, and the new policy draft policy is attached. So um, I'll take questions if there are any. Thank you. This was thrashed out in quite some um, detail in audit and risk. Um, Councillor Smith. Yeah, I assume this takes into um, the likes of the uh, credit cards and so on. Uh, I see in stuff this morning a major expose of the Bay of Plenty Councils of what uh, the credit card expenditure and the likes are being. So it does this... indeed, Councillor Smith, if you look on page 87. Well, I'm not looking at it because of my in, into, uh, IT issues that I've had trying to get onto this meeting. So I'm not going to explain that why I'm not looking at it now. But the reality is I'm just asking a question and, and um, I think Mr. Bailey is nodded. So thank you, Mr. Bailey. So I can just reiterate that we've tightened up a lot on the credit card. Uh, we, you will remember that we had a little bit of exposure in terms of an attempted fraud by third parties on the credit card. Um, and um, so that was went through. The, cards, the, how many credit cards do we have, Mr. Bailey? Just one. And that's with the chief executive, is it not? It is locked away in the office. I ha I'm the only person that has a key to it. And it okay. never leaves. It never leaves my possession when it's out of the locked cupboard. Thank you. <laughs> well you're, like, you're like the keeper of the nuclear bomb suitcase, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Councillor Beck. I think we show extraordinary prudence and fiscal responsibility in having a single uh, credit card for an organisation of our size. Um, but yes, uh, as a member of Audit and Risk, uh, I think we went through this very carefully. Uh, and as such, I'm, uh, I'm happy to move it, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Councillor Church? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. The top of page 60, 163, and I know it was being gone through carefully, but um, my, my question, I really, is, this is my question on this one is, um, out, if a maturity profile is outside the limitations beyond the 90 days, it has to be approved by council, which I, is obviously a good thing. But within what time period? I think that we should actually be clear about what that time period is on that page 163. So there's three points I want to make. That's number one. Um, so that, that's um, actually not in this policy. This policy um, that we're looking at is page 78. Yeah. Is it not? I thought it went on to this, that one. We're still on, we're still on that one. And we okay. Have, All right. Um, I'll come to that one next, next time. Thank yep. you, Mayor, Mayor Allen. Yeah, look, um, I read this yesterday and, and probably I'll just go to Councillor Smith raised about credit cards and I've just picked up on something. And this has actually happened once or twice in my term as mayor. So when I read in the second line, the credit card spending limit of 20,000, which is gold, and the maximum limit per transaction of 2,500, changes to these limits shall be approved by the Strategy and Finance Committee. Problem being... A number of times we've needed to do a transaction greater than two and a half thousand, and I've carried the damn thing for the council on my credit card, okay. which is just stupid. We create these barriers. So might I suggest in that situation, if it arises again, that we double that limit up to any transaction up to five thousand, and anything within the parameters of the twenty thousand, if need be, be approved by the mayor or the CE. Um, with prior approval. Otherwise, you've got to wait to actually go to a committee meeting to actually get approval to do a transaction greater than two and a half thousand. And this has happened a number of times where I've carried the can and I shouldn't be having to, no mayor should actually have me to use his credit card because the council one's not sufficient enough. Mr. Bailey, do you have any comment on that? Um, I'm, I will take the mayor's comments um, on board. However, I don't see, I have not personally rejected any requests for payments. Of no, you haven't, office. Colin, but it was prior to you, it did happen. And of course, remembering the credit card probably hasn't been used in two years anyway. Um, if it might have, I don't know. But at the end of the day, 
uh, quite a number of times I've carried the can for council for several, several thousands of dollars, many thousands of dollars from time to time. And I don't think it is actually, you know, I'm capable of doing that, but it's not good practice either. And, and I'm all about protecting the credit card. And I don't think, I am no way think a mayor should have a credit card. And I found that article yesterday with great interest. But in saying that, I just think sometimes we set up barriers for ourselves. Two and a half thousand dollars doesn't buy you much these days if you've been down and got groceries lately. Um, so, you know, just realise that I think there needs to be, somebody needs to have some discretion there who is not necessarily the committee. Otherwise, fancy holding a committee meeting to actually up a credit card to actually purchase or buy tickets or something online. I don't know what it is, but it is. I just think there needs to be somebody that has that discretion and 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 if there's not the trust for the mayor or the CE to be that person um I don't know who it is I just raise it as an issue as past experiences and I suggest it was probably um probably looked at in terms of our appetite for risk um in terms of fraud would that be correct yeah it possibly was but in, in saying that I agree with it but I just don't think that limit per transaction is, um, is right, considering two and a half K buys you stuff all these days. It is a shame that we did not actually have this conversation through audit and risk um, because it, that- Yeah, I think I missed the last meeting. That was the trouble. Yeah. It's already gone through there. Ms. Moana Tufongo. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I'm surprised that there's only one credit card at council. Now I'm currently on two boards where I have credit cards. The rules are really, really tight around them. We don't use them all the time. But if it saves um, finance a lot of time in the processing, I'm surprised that there aren't purchase order cards um, for staff as well. I mean, I'm, that's been with Waikato Regional Council when I used to work there, I don't know, nearly 20 years ago. So um, if the processes are tight, it can save a lot of time in the finance area and it can... Um, have better control over spending too. So, so making that comment, um, I'm just uh, thinking about if that was to be introduced in the future, would this policy uh, be enough to cover that as well? Through you, Madam Chair, um, our appetite for risk is extremely low and our tolerance for fraud, well, we have no tolerance for fraud. Um, our uh, credit card transactions um, typically are two or three a month, that's all. Um, that's my experience, um, and I'm the sole keeper of the credit card. So, um, but having said that, um, it, it's not a great burden on the finance department at all. Um, to, to be fair, and um, I think this policy covers a lot more than just the credit card um, transactions. It's it's it mm. deals with a whole lot more than just the credit cards. Um, but having said that, um, yes, I. Uh, there was a suggestion that we use P cards, etc. Um, the Audit and Risk Committee decided against that. Thank you, Cal Thank you, Colin. Council Smith. Yeah, just supporting the mayor's comments, and it probably wouldn't be a, appropriate for a mayor to recommend that um, the limit go up if they were going to be the one that approved it. Um, so, if there's any appetite, I would be happy to go to five, any perhaps ten, um, but. I would certainly look at five um, would that, and, and ask Mr. Bailey, would that be with the escalating costs and looking to the future, whether that would be a reasonable figure? Um, I can only reiterate what, I, what I've said about seeing transactions that have come through in the last year or so, and there are none which exceed $2,500. Um, so we've not had to, to go in contrary to policy but, but, or... But if the mayor, sorry to interrupt, Colin, if the mayor has uh, used his credit card and then made a mayoral claim, it would be fair to say that mayoral claims have exceeded two and a half thousand on that basis, surely. I, I would, yes, um, yes, that's probably true. I have no visibility on the mayoral claims, unfortunately, so I, I can't comment on that. Oh, okay. Maybe, maybe I can help you. So, look, um, sorry for butting in, Madam Chair. So, I've had up to seven thousand dollars sitting on my credit card in the past for council. You know, and, and, and I don't mind that because I know I'm going to get reimbursed. But but the issue is, is um, it's, and I've had problems. I've been in the office and I know, Colin, it hasn't, you haven't had visibility two and a half years. Damn credit card hasn't been used for two and a half years. So you're not likely to have visibility. But I know prior to that, 
there would be some issues in the office some mornings when they're trying to book flights for staff or for counsellors for conference and things like that. And we keep exceeding the credit card. And I just say to the end, well, use my credit card and I'll claim it back. And that's what I'm saying. The, the, the two and a half thousand these days is not enough money to lose sleep over. If anything, it should be double that. And I, you know, if Councillor Smith is advocating for five thousand dollars, but if it goes, if you want to leave it at two and a half thousand, then it doesn't have to come back for that expenditure to exceed that to a committee. It, somebody needs to have the authority, and be it either the mayor or the CE have that authority, or the COO have the authority to allow that transaction. I That's think. What I'm saying to you. I think for clarity, you would want, you would thinking about the audit and risk committee, you would want to have a number in here and not leave it up to individuals to approve it. And and I see your point and, and philosophically I'm happy to move that to five thousand um, dollars. But I would be very reluctant to go away from the process that is in the in the best practices of audit uh, and have individuals this is what the whole process of the audit committee has been is to try and regularize it and make sure that these things don't happen i'm not suggesting anybody has any ulterior motive whatsoever but we must, this is not our money and we must be super super clear about it and so um i'm, I'm on the side of mr bailey here councillor smith yeah i i would be happy for it to go to five thousand, madam chair but i also think the fact that we have committee meetings every six weeks uh, and while we can have emergency ones it, it does seem that um, uh, maybe any two of the, the mayor, the CEO and the COO, um, because that can be, you know, it's transparent. Two people are making the decision, not one. Um, but I, I don't like to do things on the fly and, and would like probably to give it more time uh, through audit and risk. But um, I certainly think in the meantime, the, the amount could go to 5,000. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Gibb. Um, I just, just thought I'd point out that it says any changes to the limit goes to strategy and finance, and that could stay like that. Um, and anything over 2500 I agree with Councillor Smith, you could just have any exceptions authorised by two out of those three he mentioned, Mayor, CEO, mm -hmm. or COO. And then that would solve the problem straight away, because as Mayor Allen said, it hasn't been over the limit for a long time, but occasionally, and when we get out of Omicron, it might start... Um, being that way. And as Colin said, it's only minimal ones that get done regularly during the month. I'm more comfortable at the two and a half thousand with an exception report authorised by two out of those three senior staff. I, I can live with that, Madam Chair. I'm sorry? Yeah. I can live you with that. You're happy with that? I don't, I don't have a problem with that either. It's just the way it's set at the moment, it just, it's just clumsy and it will fall back onto somebody else funding council's business again, as I've done in the past. And, and, and that's not the way we should be running our business. Okay, so would you want to put the chair of strategy and finance in that mix as well? Mm. Well, I think... That, 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 is any, that is any three of those... No, I don't know. Because I've dealt with that type of thing when you've had... Um, multiple numbers of people and it's damn hard to get a hold of people when you need them because these things only occur very very rarely I would say any two of the three yeah that's been mentioned okay yeah. so um do we have that um I, I'm that happy to move it as an amendment um, so so um sorry I'm just trying to find my um gosh trying trying to I'm sorry I'm trying to find the um the, the recommendation um, oh, okay. That it's that it's adopted. Um, yes, you need to have an amendment there, Councillor Smith. Happy to do that, Madam Chair. Any two of the three, being the Mayor, CEO, or COO, um, and, and I'm happy to leave it then at the. Do we go with the five thousand, or stay with the two and a half? I'm, I'm looking for a consensus. Two and a half's all right. It just um, needs flexibility. Okay. Yep. So to, uh, to, uh, yep so two and a half. Yeah. With those three. Yeah. Do I have a, a seconder for that amendment? Uh, thank you, uh, Councillor Thompson. Um, so that amendment is carried and becomes um, the... Um, well, well, in reality, Madam Chair, maybe a point of order there, and because yeah. we didn't actually have a mover, it, it was the substantive motion. 
It was only a recommendation. So yeah. it is the I substantive one. Yeah. I did actually move it. Uh, Council oh, Beck moved it. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, Council Beck moved it, and there was a hand up. Yeah. Next thing. Right. Um, to second it. No. No. Um, I'm against it. You. Uh, okay. So you're against. Again, I'm against. Uh, I think the council has really good process. Um, and we have committees set up specifically to look at things in particular. And I always feel uncomfortable when things happen on the fly because that's what I feel that this is. Something's happening on the fly. And based on that, you know, going outside regular process and trying to make decisions without any extra papers or recommendations, apart from the conversation that we've had, you know, I don't support that. Okay. So I, I'm voting against that. Thank you. No, that's fine. So, um, so we've done with that motion, I think, because that became all. We had Councillor Smith and Councillor Thompson, correct? So yes. that's, um, um, everybody was in favour. Um, um, Ms. Moana Tufongai was against, and that's carried. Thank you. Um, well, that was sensitive. Um, so um, 6.6 .6 now uh, is the uh, Treasury Risk Management Policy Review, uh, and that is, a, that is again, um, Mr. Bailey, uh, and on page 97. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, so this policy was, has, has been reviewed and it has been workshopped twice with councillors, um, and it is, um, we've included, uh, we've um, actually um, Use Price Waterhouse Coopers, our Treasury consultants, to review the policy and, and advise us on this. Um, the, the, the changes are laid out in the report. Um, Price Waterhouse uh, presentation, Price Waterhouse Coopers presentation is also as an appendix. Um, and the policy before and after changes is also included. Um, a lot of the changes are legislative and, and make no um, difference to the operations of the policy um, for us, um, but we have some treasury uh, benchmarking changes, which we've been through at both workshops. So um, I'll take the report as read and take questions. Thank you. And this, this one's also been through the Audit and Risk Committee, yes? Yeah, thank Correct. you. Thank you. Um, any questions on Ms. Moana Tufonga? Is your hand? No, oh, not up. Okay, um, Councillor Church. Yes, Madam Chair. So just making sure I'm on the right page this time. Is that page 108? So part of this, if I'm reading my papers right? Correct, it is. Yes, thank you. So at the bottom of that, just one point is, it says in the last point of number 11, monitor Treasury exposure on a regular basis. Um, the, yeah, so just my question is, I don't actually personally feel it's um, specific enough, like on a monthly basis would be more specific. Um, I'm happy to get some feedback from Colin. Okay, um, we we look at Treasury um, at the at the most simplest level every day. In other words, we look at bank transactions and look and our forecast. We have a, a cash flow forecast, etc., which rolls is a rolling six month period. We have a monthly Treasury compliance report, um, which goes to uh, senior management, um, and every quarter. We have our Treasury Compliance Report, which goes to Strategy and Finance Committee. Um, that's our process at the moment. Um, and yeah, so um, if, if you want something more specific, we can put something of that nature into the, into the document, um, if you wish. I think it sounds pretty comprehensive there, Mr. Bailey. Um, Councillor Beck. Indeed, thank you. Um, yeah, I just wanted to draw uh, councillors' attention to page 123, uh, which is the fixed floating interest rate risk control table uh, that has been the subject of conversation from time to time in the chamber, generally with the benefit of hindsight. <laughs> mm. um, so this is, this is the table where we attempt to look forward, and I'm at... Uh, Councillor Woolerton is, is, a, uh, is an apology for this uh, meeting today, but he's uh, in particular showed interest in this table. We just need to be comfortable 
uh, that this represents where we would like to be looking forward with the absolute certainty and guarantee, I think, Colin, that we will get it wrong uh, on occasion, but we'll attempt to be more right than wrong uh, by staying within the, the minimum and maximum fixed range. So I just wanted to make sure there was clarity around that because it's, it is impossible to always get it right, but it's about taking a prudent position on behalf of council. And uh, so if we approve this uh, policy today, we just need to be comfortable that this is one of those key components within it that, um, uh, that we need to be aware of. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor, we, we tested those parameters um, very uh, clearly with Price Waterhouse on the number of scenarios. Um, and we found that those were the correct parameters for um, what could we would anticipate could happen in the future. Um, but you're right. Um, there are will be instances, well, there could be instances where we are um, unforeseen circumstances, etc. Um, but we've tested them. We've done run a number of scenarios through it, through the modelling, and those scenarios, those parameters, appear to put were the clear the winners, if you like. Mm. in terms of covering the risk going forward. And I'm, I'm reminded of the uh, quote from a Nobel winning, winning physicist who I can't remember just now, the name of, sadly, uh, who said that uh, predictions are always tricky, uh, especially about the future. Uh, and I guess that's also true, uh, you know, in this space. But uh, with that, I'm, I'm happy to move it, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you very much. Um, do I have a second of, for that? Uh, Councillor McAnally. That's fine. Okay, all in favour? Hands, please. Thank you. Against? Was that a, Councillor Church, was that a in favour hand or an against hand? Uh, I actually had a comment. It was why China was in our um, portfolio of, of um, banking, actually. That was my question. Oh. I didn't why? think it was appropriate. That was why, why I was wondering, asking the question. That was what I wanted to do. Right. Why? Why we got China as a bank in our credit, um, like on page 127. Um, sorry, I'm Councillor. I'm, I don't have the full agenda on my. Um... So we've got uh, a matrix around the counterparty insurers with local yeah. New Zealand government, registered yeah. superannuators, local government funding agency, state owned yeah. enterprises, banks of ASB, ANZ, Kiwi Bank, Westpac, but then we've got the Bank of China which I thought was kind of uh, questioning why we, we need China as part of that portfolio when we seem to have, yeah. I think there's, there's two reasons. One is that they may be investors in, our, in, in the loans that we, we put through with the LGFA in terms of bonds, et cetera. Um, and I think the other reason is probably historical. So um, I'll, I, I, can I take that under review and get back oh. to you on that one? Yeah, thank you. Well, maybe just perhaps just give us an update at the next strategy and finance meeting. But it's not a it's not a, a mandated band. It's no, it's not. No, no. no. Um, thank you very much. That's um, that was carried, and we now have uh, page nine, page one nine seven, the Enabling Housing Supply Act update and approach from the very sartorial Mr. Ebenhoe. <laughs> It's a great word. I wish <laughs> I earned it more often. Um, <laughs> Take it away. Good morning, Madam Chair, Mayor, Councillors, Mrs. Moana Tupangai. Um, we've had a workshop on this topic, uh, this, this piece of legislation that we now need to respond to. And essentially, while this is a decision report today, I'm hoping it's a um, fairly straightforward set of decisions. Um, there's a couple noting recommendations around submissions we have made on this and related RM reform legislation. And in terms of this um, Enabling Housing Supply Act, um, it's essentially endorse, uh, asking you to endorse or approve our collaboration with our Future Proof partners, um, including Waikato Tainui, Waikato River Authority, other relevant authorities, et cetera, um, just to help get some economies of scale around the work we're doing around it, as well as consistency of approach, um, noting that we have at officer level, I've um, been doing this already, but um, if there's mm -hmm. some funding to be contributed in a, in a shared way, it would be good to have this endorsement and also happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. I think a collegial approach 
given our boundaries is important. Um, and just before I ask for any questions, um, I do note that you call it to be, that it's, it's deemed to be low under the council's significant and engagement policy because it's a general approach. And I understand that, but it's actually something that is, that is going to be of huge impact on all our communities. Um, so it is something that we have to take into account in terms of, um, am I reading your mind, Councillor Beck, that we have to take into account for uh, um, communication uh, as, we, as we move through this? Councillor Beck. That's right. Uh, this is potentially quite incendiary uh, in its effect as, uh, as you know, potentially individual developers will look away from the spirit of the intent of our communities as, as catching the blueprints or the growth aspirations in our, you know, in our strategy or future proofs uh, document for that matter and effectively trump it with this uh, piece of legislation um, that's come through. And, uh, and Jim, I, <laughs> I think also we, we have to note that we were spectacularly unsuccessful in uh, being heard or at least having our points registered uh, in terms of the submission we made through this process. I think uh, other than the... Uh, uh, to Turi uh, Waimana or Te Awa Waikato, apart from that becoming a qualifying matter, most other points we raised or supported in that uh, joint submission with uh, Waikato Tainui, HCC and uh, Waipa uh, were generally not uh, not adopted by that um, um, city committee process. So this, yes, it, it's, it's pretty much a, let's make the best of, of the hand now dealt. Um, and I think doing so collegially is the right way. Um, but yes, it's, uh, let's not underestimate the potential impact this will have and, and indeed the incendiary effect on our communities uh, as well as. Uh, thank you. And, and none of this should be, um, or none of the background should be of, of any surprise to you. We've gone through this a number of times and had submissions given to us uh, that, um, Council Beck, did you, was that what you presented off to the select committee? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Councillor Maguire. Yeah, I'm disappointed, Axel, that uh, <clears throat> you didn't make much headway with your submission uh, because I think it's going to um, have quite an impact on the communities. I think it'll build more ghettos and it will uh, happy housing. And uh, yeah, I'm very. Yeah, uh, I think the community needs to fully understand uh, what's going on with us. And when you look at the in full around Hamilton, that's you know it's not good in my view, and what I see. And uh, it's disappointing that uh, you couldn't make any headway because um, uh, yeah, having future proof, um, you know, put, trying to put a stake in the ground to sort of get a better result. Um, it's a bit disappointed you couldn't achieve it. So, um, but no, I don't like it at all. And um, um, yeah, uh, it's uh, disappointing. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. And I think there's, there's two issues here. One is whether we like it or not as a material, it's here. Hmm. Um, do, and the question is, do we, do we enter into a collaboration um, with our future-proof partners? And uh, like uh, Councillor Beck, I think, you know, that, that there is more power in numbers and there's more more collaboration, more collegiality. Ms. Moana Tufangai. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, the, just a comment, it's really just a comment about um, Future Proof Partners. So the, um, while Waikato Tainui is the face of um, Tainui Waka Alliance, the partner is Tainui Waka Alliance when it comes to that space. And Tainui Waka Alliance represents Manyaputo, Hauraki, Waikato, and Raukawa. So, you know, you've got more um, errors in your quiver than you realise. So Manyaputo is part of it. Um, so the Tainui Waka Alliance um, meets, they pick their rep, they generally go with Waikato because most of the ground area covered sits in the Waikato region, but Waikato is not the only part partner in the alliance. That's the only point I want to make. No, that's a good, good point. Thank you. Um, Thank you. That's very helpful. Yeah. So um, there's no other questions. Council Beck, you moved that, I think. Did you? Yes. And do I have a seconder for it? 
Please, thank you, Councillor Gibb. Um, all in favour, please raise your hand. Against, sorry, I don't see any against. Thank you very much, Carrie. Thank you for that. Um, I think we all have the same feelings, but but we need to move on with, with the process of it. Um, right, so item 6.8 um, on page 250 is the, uh, the future constitution of the Waikato District Licensing Committee, and that is, um, golly gee, see it, Ms. Sarah. Please. Sarah yep. Burke's online to present this. Yep. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Madam Chair, um, Councillors. Uh, this report um, serves two purposes, really. One is seeking just to tidy up some administrative uh, details in terms of expiry dates for some of our list members. Um, and the second, arguably more important, more philosophical question as to whether or not uh, the Policy and Regulatory Committee is minded to make any changes to the constitution of the District Licensing Committee. Um, and by that, I mean whether or not um, you'd like to move away from having an elected member of Waikato District Council being the chairperson and move to a commissioner-based um, approach. Both, uh, uh, both approaches are permissible under the relevant legislation, which is the Sale and Supply of Alcohol Act. Um, and there's quite a bit of information in this report. Um, I apologize, I did try and make it shorter than it was, but I do like to talk. So on that note, I might stop and um, let you ask me any questions. We have, we have the power of the mute button. <laughs> <laughs> you might need it. But obviously not on your writing, but it's a very good report and it was really helpful. Thank you. Mayor Allen. Yeah, thanks for the report, Sarah. Um, look, originally when this was set up, um, when I gave some um, terms of reference uh, for original setup, was to actually, uh, like I tried to do with a number of things, is have a, a bit of local flavour along with a bit of external. So that's why there was a mix of both um, council, councillors and independents. I think what I've discovered over time in dealing with this, and when was the setup? About 2012, 13, I think, Sarah, somewhere around there. Been, yeah. um, I think what I have found in the last decade with this is, um, and this has happened to me a number of times where people have been unsatisfied with the outcome of the decision that's been made, or in some cases, um, they've tried to do to influence the outcome of the decision through myself, or in the past, I know a number of councillors have been pressured to actually um, try and persuade certain others to see the world their way. Um, and I actually think it, this is one of those things where it actually shouldn't have a political influence within the decision-making mechanisms. We're probably one of the only councils that actually have adopted this approach and probably for my mind to actually remove politicians as decision-makers is probably the best way forward to maintaining its total independence. So for that reason, I was the instigator of very original, so I'm going to move this um, because I think it is a good step forward to actually take that political influence out of the decision-making part of it. Excellent. Thank you, Mayor Allen. Um, Councillor Gibb. Um, yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I can see all the positives in what's in this report. Um, I just have one question, um, and, and it may already be taken into account by the the staff that work in that area, and that is um, the local things that are happening around that space. So uh, my only concern is that if we don't have a mechanism to check maybe with the local councillor about local knowledge, then we could perhaps see a gap somewhere. But I, I maybe Sarah can answer me on that one. Uh, so the local alcohol policy is something that you'd still retain the control over influencing, and that one's coming up before you shortly if you haven't already seen a version of it. Um, so that would be where the councillor and the local flavour kind of gets inserted into the rules that you'd like the uh, committee, whoever is constituted on a particular committee, to consider in your local context. So I think um, it's, not a, it's not a matter of necessarily losing any control of the, over that, that side of things. Um, that's that's my view on, on that part of it. So I don't think you'd lose anything because we still get, have the local alcohol policy. Um, Councillor Smith might like to correct me if I've got that wrong. <laughs> um, no, I think perhaps not, Sarah. Um, Councillor Maguire?
Yeah, you know, I should have been ready. Um, yeah, I still support the uh, political side of it. I, I think it's um, I think it's worked very very well, um, despite uh, the mayor might get pressured once in the blue moon. But I don't believe um, uh, <clears throat> there's been much pressure put on politicians over this period of time, and uh, I um, I'm <clears throat> I, I um, would prefer to, um, and I will vote against this if um, there's not a flavour to stick with the politicians. Um, yeah, I I think it's good. I think it's good, and um, I think it gives a good balance. And uh, just because others are doing it the other way, it doesn't mean say we have to. Just like Easter trading. <clears throat> anyway, um, I'll leave it at that. Um, thank you. And I, I mean, I can say from my own perspective, I have been frequently approached by people wanting me to um, have influence on the, on the thinking of the District Licensing Committee. And I think the, the more arm's length it is, the more robust and pure the process is. Um, I, just I think you'll have that anyway, won't you? Um, regardless of which way you go. <laughs> Who would know? Um, I have a question for Ms. Burke in, in the recommendation um, in uh, point, sorry, point B, um, who is not an elected member, um, sorry, um, not an elected member, and that is of the Waikato District Council. Am I right in thinking that? And can staff be members of the committee? No. So should we... Do we spell that out and should it be explicitly spelled out in that as well with the addition of, um, so under B, um, no, we need to, how, we need to phrase that because it, that it, it, otherwise it talks, it, it implies it's that further commissioner. Um, transitions to an independent committee. Um, I think we need to have a line which says the committee um, shall not, comprise um, elected members or staff of the Waikato District Council. Is that correct? Um, that, that would be correct if, if that was decision made, yes. Um, yeah, happy to work on that. So um, I'm happy to move that as an amendment. Do well, I... hang, hang on, maybe you don't have to. I'm happy to accept that as the original mover. Oh, okay, good o. Sorry. Yeah. Yep. Good o. That was my official happy moment. Um, okay, so we will add that into that to that B. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and do I have a seconder on this, please? Um, just um, we might need to add it into A as well because we do put with no elected yep. members in A exactly. as well. Yep. yep. So A and B. Yep. 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 Thank you. Just just to be very clear about it all. Um, we have a mover there. Um, do I have a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Patterson, thank you. All in favour, please raise a hand. Uh, thank you. And against, um, that's Councillor Maguire, Councillor Henderson, and Ms Moana Tufongai. And Madam Chair, if I abstain, please. Yes, thank you very much. Can I just give Rob an example of why I don't want politicians on it? Because one of the worst instance I had around pressure on board to bear on me was actually from somebody within your ward, Rob. So, so that sort of cemented my thoughts around politicians shouldn't be in the middle of this. Well, yeah. Can I just <laughs> ask that I be recorded as abstaining, please? Correct. And 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 I will declare it carried, um, even with the little bits in between. And I note the perfectly timed arrival of our chief executive. You couldn't have done that better if you'd tried. Did you try? No. Has he got his okay. cape on? Hey, well, I think he has his cape on. Um, we are now up to, surprisingly, um, the Chief Executive uh, Business Plan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. I've just got to find the... Ah, not as perfect as we thought. No. <laughs> Sorry, I've just had, um, I just had discussions with auditors. Not not our auditors, other auditors. Oh. So. Right. Are you feeling all right? Oh yeah, yeah, I'm fine. 
it's just time consuming that's all yeah. it's all right um... Madam Chair, what item is this? This is item, this is item six point one, the Chief Executive's performance. Uh, this Chief Executive, sorry, not performance review, business plan. It's not here, Madam Chair. It's Didn't verbal. Me. Okay, <laughs> all right. So, um, out here. What's that? He said it. I, he said it wasn't there, and I said it's verbal, and now you're here. Okay, all right. So um, I guess my summation, Madam Chair, would be that um, we're, we're progressing on most fronts, um, delays around capital works, uh, and that's continuing to be a source of, um, of challenge uh, in terms of, for two reasons, um, the supply chain issues, but related to that is, is absences from our contractors and also our own staff being absent as well through illness. So I think those are two, two reasons and I'm sure that that'll be covered in more depth than Roger's um, or in uh, Councillor Patterson's uh, infrastructure committee meeting coming up. Um, we had, as an example, when Councillor Patterson was present, we had a discussion um, with water care at the Waters Governance Board meeting last week around this. Um, my feeling is they are too optimistic about what they will be able to achieve before the end of the financial year. Um, and I think that was kind of the concession that was made at the time that they probably are. And um, so you know, I think that was um, that was an outcome of that. Um, other things, I think, Madam Chair, as per normal, are sort of trucking along. So, um, I'll just probably leave it there, if I may. Unless anyone's got any specific Thank you. questions. Councillor Church has a question. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Gavin. Just on that first point around, like you know, the COVID impacts and the people being away in terms of delivery of projects. So yeah, you know, that's difficult for council and for all staff. So my question is, so there's any systemic issues that cause the late delivery of infrastructure projects for the last three to five years in our LTP? Because we didn't have COVID, pre-COVID, are you saying that those are fixed? So that when we come out of the COVID period again, and we don't have COVID, we don't have material losses, and we don't have people away to the same level, that the systems will work and that will actually be able to deliver on time as per the LTP? Well, well look, I'm happy to start answering that, but it's really a question that, that comes up at the Infrastructure Committee. But look, I'll, I'll do my best to answer that. Um, we've worked pretty hard in the last few years to address concerns around the delivery of capital projects. Um, and Roger has outlined that in quite some depth to um, the infrastructure committee in the past couple of years. Uh, our success and failure in the waters area is very much tied up in our contract with Watercare. Um, they are experiencing the same challenges that we have. I guess we had maybe unrealistic expectations that their size and scale would, would give us more of an advantage than we're seeing at present. Um, but uh, yeah, I the assurance they've given us is whilst they are saying that their performance this year is likely to be down on the latest forecast, they are saying that they believe over a three year period, they will catch up the Capital Works program. And that's a fairly significant chunk of what's included. So that's probably my summation, um, Councillor um, Church. I don't know if Roger wants to add anything to that. Uh, yeah, I probably can, Gavin. Um, thank you for that. And through you, Madam Chair, 
Uh, look, the, the Capital Works program, um, what you'll hear at infrastructure is we've had a target of about 152 million, including waters this year. And uh, the reality is year to date, we've spent probably about 35 million and the teams have all done a, a forward forecast of what they believe they will spend between now and the end of June. But the numbers coming back feel optimistic and that's what Gavin has highlighted. The teams are saying they believe they'll be able to deliver about 100 million this year. So that means in the next three to four months, there's another 60 odd million to be delivered. Um, and, and there is some science behind that. The teams haven't just plucked those numbers, uh, but I think they are being optimistic. Uh, part of the conversation at, at uh, the Waters Governance Board was around, uh, do you keep encouraging a stretch target with the staff so that they achieve better things or do you accept no no it's it's a really hard environment and we're going to accept a, a sub level of performance here um so that's not the that's not the strategy we're encouraging the teams to think outside the square and deliver what they can the question the council of church is asking is are the systemic issues addressed um and part of the answer to that one is is the overall performance better, worse, or the same as previous years, even though we've got the trying conditions we're under. And actually the performance is better, even though we've had the tough conditions that we've got. So I believe we have made some significant gains and inroads. Um, I think one of the things we've clearly determined is to spend large CapEx sums, there is a lot of pre-planning and consenting work that feeds into that, particularly with wastewater treatment plants in the water space. And that's the sort of work we are now doing. So I'm confident moving forward, we are doing better planning on what needs to be done to spend the capital um, to actually deliver the things to our communities. So short answer is yes, I think things are definitely better than they were. And uh, once the economy and, and all the challenges in front of us settle down, we'll be operating at a very different level to what we have been in the past. Thank you, Roger. Thank you, Roger. That's re really clear. Look, I'm going to move this other questions. I'm going to move to Councillor Lynch. I would, sorry, Madam Chair, I'd just like to flag the community facilities on that. As it, for the oh, no, I'm going to move to Councillor Lynch and then I'll come back to you. Thank you, Madam Chair. And um, this kind of segues sort of uh, to my, my question, Gavin. Can you tell me how many vacancies we have at the moment? I think it's 54, I 50. believe. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Beck. Uh, <clears throat> yes, I'm, I'm just picking up on uh, Councillor Smith's uh, where is this item coming from point, and I must <clears throat> I confess myself a little bit confused now as well that I look at it. Uh, I'm well aware of, the, um, uh, of Gavin's report because I've seen it in another forum. Uh, but actually, when I look at our, our public web, website giving notice of this meeting, um, the report is uh, listed on the agenda as 6.1, but it's not in the papers as far as I can see. So in other words, we've not publicly notified uh, this item. And in our own Dropbox, um, it's not on the agenda or in the papers. So I'm just, I'm just concerned that this is actually quite an important matter. Our community has a great deal of interest in the Chief Executive's uh, report, obviously. Um, and I fear, and Dalian uh, or someone from Democracy may be able to assist here, I just fear we haven't actually notified or given appropriate transparency for this matter being on the agenda today, that the paper's not available. <clears throat> Correct me if I'm wrong. That's just my... Thank you, Ex Thank you, Axel. Well, look, I'm happy to respond to that, Madam Chair. So um, apologies, I've been away on leave, so um, I didn't have time to update the report. Uh, it is on the agenda as a verbal report. Um, it was either that or, or not included at all. Um, so, yeah, so all I can do is apologise. If you remember, Councillor Beck, we normally see this as the um, performance against the um, KPIs as well, the, you know, the big picture plan, so, and where we're going with it. Um, but the, the value of it is actually more in the verbal report. And I'm, I'm 
personally quite happy to see it as a as a verbal report. But, um, I take your point on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, and I'm sorry, I wasn't looking for an apology. I, I was really just saying it, it's a matter of quite some importance, particularly given the delay in delivery of um, of capital projects, which we've talked about extensively in other forum as well. So mm. uh, as well, um, yeah. So I just, um, uh, yes, you're, you're quite right. It says it's a verbal business plan. It's just difficult to formulate uh, questions and repeat, so knowing what to repeat and what not to repeat from other fora, um, because otherwise it looks as though elected members are, um, I guess, not responding to uh, to the comments raised. Uh, which fair point. Fair point. I'll leave that with Gavin uh, on that. Uh, Council McGuire. Um, I yeah, agree with um, Axel there, but the um, uh, the 50 million, Roger, is that due to COVID or what's it due to the normal in inability on our part to spend what we allocate? Uh, look, I think we, we will unpack that in detail at infrastructure next week. Um, that's probably best left for that. Yeah, that I think that's more appropriate. Thank you, mm -hmm. Mr McCulloch. Um, right, so we have, um, thank you, I think that's, oh, sorry, Councillor Church, did you have another question? Yeah, I, I did, but I'm happy to bring up, an, I just want to flag for infrastructure was, it's great about the waters, Roger, but it's really, I guess, around those community facilities, because I think we're tracking about between 50 and 60% outcomes as opposed to the budget. But also, I wanted to also say that, you know, I'm very aware that, and I'm in awe of the, actually the staff are working incredibly hard and under a huge amount of stress to keep the wheels turning. And I'd like to acknowledge that. So when I'm asking these questions around the future and how we perform, it's, it's underlined with um, that uh, respect for the amount of work that your team has doing and the improvements made. Good, good point and thank you. And, and, and we will um, go into that in more detail in, in the infrastructure meeting. Um, Right now, what I need is for um, somebody to move us into public excluded. Councillor Gibb and Councillor Lynch, all in favour? 